expert, we want to understand what's the nature of reality, what's the nature of ourselves, and philosophy claims, metaphysics in specific, that it can help us really make progress. What, what are some of the ways that, indeed, philosophy in general, metaphysics in particular, have really made progress in helping us understand anything? Well, it's going to be a particular kind of philosophy and a kind of metaphysics, because I have no, nothing to say about what uh, the general line of philosophers have done. Tell me but what you want. Here comes where Heidegger comes in and helps us. And I think of Heidegger as the ultimate existential phenomenologist. Here's the one. Uh, I've always wondered, and maybe other people have too, what in the world were those Greeks talking about in Homer when they were talking about the gods, okay. Apollo and Athena and uh, uh, Artemis and so forth. They were so much like us in so many ways, if you read the Odyssey or the Iliad, the right. same kind of passions, the same perception, yeah. the same needs and the same so loves even. And yet they believe these gods had this immense power over them. And Heidegger says in one point, just sort of in passing, the gods are the attuning ones. And I sort of tried to say, okay, what does that mean? I'll teach the Odyssey and I'll see if I can find out. Yes, what, did, what, they disco what you discover if you do that is that the Homeric Greeks understood that moods were very important in our life. And Heidegger does say that. I mean, he doesn't just talk about the Homeric Greeks. He says that moods attune us to ourselves, to our situation, to each other. And the fact that moods are just sort of ignored by the main line of <laughs> metaphysics and analytic <laughs> philosophers and everybody is, is interesting. And then you discover, wow, moods are important. I mean, Helen runs away with Paris because at that night, uh, Aphrodite shines on them. And at that point, everything shows up as erotic. Even her, she leaves her husband and her new child to run off with Paris. Moods are very powerful. And she never apologizes. Because in Homer, that was a god. And if a god tells you run off with an attractive foreigner who's spending the night at your house, you, it's to your credit if you do it. And don't say, oh, whine and worry about your husband and child. Okay, that's the first one. Okay. Okay, now, it also tells us about our way of being in the world, which is a, somehow not news exactly, in a way Aristotle knew it, but it got lost that we are mostly in the world by way of our involved coping with things, using things, having skills and expertise. And generally, Heidegger language is finding our way around in the world, knowing how he gives a whole discussion of familiarity. We discover another hidden thing, that we have a familiarity with this room. That means that if it gets hot in here under normal circumstances, we are just drawn to open a window, that we know that we are going to sit in the chairs and not on the floor. And we, but we don't have to think that. We have, the, it shows up in the way the room looks. And the, what we learn isn't a bunch of facts that we store in our memory. What we learn is that the world looks richer and richer. For instance, Merleau-Ponty example uh, now, the, the, a, a city looks strange and confusing and very meaningless at first. But once you get, live in it a while, it, the, what you know begins to show up in the city. The turn to the right looks like the way to the bakery, and the <laughs> turn to the left looks like the way to the cleaners, and <laughs> so forth. It just looks that way. You don't have to figure out how to get to the bakery. So we learn that there is that our way of being in the world is such that we don't have to store anything in our mind. The world is the best model of itself. And this is a very rich and different understanding. That Completely, it, it, yes. Totally new and gives you lots to think about. And it also has an amazing power in the real world because there were these people at MIT when I was teaching at MIT trying to make artificial intelligence by wanting to store a model of the world in the mind or the computer. They said, we're just like computers and computers are just like us. We have what they called formal representations and so that everything I know about the world has to be inside the computer as a list of things it knows about the world and we have such a list in our brain and they failed completely because that isn't how it is. And your famous work about what computers can do predicts that they, they took the other, the, the traditional philosophical view, they, the artificial intelligence people, turned it into a research program. If you know Heidegger, you know that you can't make a model of the world in the mind, that the best model of the world is the world it's itself. The world. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that, and they failed in about 
well, Marvin Minsky says that uh, at the beginning of the 70s, uh, AI was brain dead because it had run into the common sense knowledge problem. Mm -hmm. That means that they'd run into the problem of how we know about the room we're in. Mm -hmm. And they ran into something called the frame problem. How is it that when you change something, what, if, if in my, if I move something in the world, say this, flower pot, then what do I have to change in my representation of the world? Mm -hmm. And nobody could ever figure that out. Of course, if you've got the world as its own representation, you, right you see what you change. Okay. And then, and then it, what didn't change, didn't yeah. change. And once they saw that, they started making a whole different kind of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which is now called Heideggerian AI, <laughs> in which their slogan is that the world is the best uh, representation <laughs> model of itself. Okay, now, the, the one more, if, and this one is, this one is too hard to do, but I'll just mention it. I mean, after all, philosophers have tried to understand the meaning of life. That is, what, why are we here? And what is the highest form of life that we could have? People like Kierkegaard and Sartre and Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger, the people I read, or Pascal, are all concerned with that. And roughly, they've got some version of the view that having some commitment to some cause or to some person is the highest thing you can have and that will give your life meaning and then they describe in detail what happens w when you do that and that's another whole contribution. Well, that's fascinating because uh, what we see is, 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 is certainly the latter being the foundation for uh, uh, much of the, certainly the religious uh, activities in the world and the, the political commitments. I mean, it has great uh, uh, application. That's right. And that's what existential phenomenology is, uh, is about. They understand that.